Hey, welcome back for more Bio 20. We're going to talk about microbes in terms of prokaryotes, protists, and the fungi. So here are the objectives and what we're going over. So when we look at the diversity of life that's out there, there's um, there's a lot of species. And, you know, yeah, we're using the word species, and these are all guesstimates, and I've shown you different estimates from different sources before. But one of the good questions to ask would be like, how did we get this many different species? And in order to deal with that, we need to address how old is the Earth. So the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. How do we know that? The way that we figured this out is through radioactive dating. And this is going or bringing us back to the start of the class when we dealt with neutrons and the fact that neutrons deal with the stability of an atom. And under certain circumstances, the instability could lead to a decay process. Here's where it gets useful. It turns out there are crystals called zircons. And zircons are uranium crystals. So they're radioactive. They're found in very particular spots of molten rock. And so they're just, like I said, they're nice pure uranium crystals. Uranium, or at least the form of uranium that we're seeing in these ones here, turns out to be particularly unstable, and it decays over time to form lead. Lead, or at least this form of lead, is actually derived from uranium. It doesn't naturally exist on its own. It has to, it's a decay product. So, the assumption then becomes, when this zircon is formed, it's going to be just a these uranium crystals, and then as it cools and it's no longer being mixed around, eventually some of that uranium is going to be converted to lead. And what we can do is we can actually measure the rate of the conversion. Turns out it has what we call a half-life of something like 2 billion years. And then what we can do is measure the ratio of their uranium to lead. So, based upon those ratios that we see, we can use that as a timing mechanism. So it's kind of like when you've heard of like carbon dating, except this is using uranium instead of carbon, because carbon doesn't last that long, but uranium does. So, based upon what we could figure out, we know the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old, and based upon modeling, it took about a billion years for the Earth to cool, why did it take that long? Lots of hypotheses out there. One of them could involve the fact that we made the moon because something really big hit us and it blasted a chunk of the Earth out. But we know as soon as that cool down ended, which is about 3.6 billion years ago, life came to be. And we found the earliest fossils of life. How life started... There's lots of hypotheses for this one, and unfortunately, there's no real definitive evidence because any situation that we could think of where, hey, let's look in this spot to see if life is evolving or not, well, if, it, if it's the right conditions for life to evolve, then wouldn't there be life there already? So that unfortunate little bit of a conundrum makes it really hard to deal with this. But there have been two proposals that, that have been uh, thrown around. One of them is referred to as the RNA world. That is when we look at basically anything that we know is definitely alive. It uses RNA. And that, <coughs> excuse me, is somewhat interesting. So maybe life started as RNA and then eventually DNA is what evolved to kind of keep things stable. But again, well, how did we get the cells to form and all that stuff? That's There's more to this story than I'm telling, but I'm just leaving it as simple as that. Another one that some people like to use is what's referred to as the seeding hypothesis, and that is um, everything came from space. And unfortunately, that's just kicking the can down the road because then you can ask the question of, well, where did that stuff come from? We do know that conditions can exist to make things like RNA. This was actually confirmed in the 50s by something called the Miller-Urey experiment, which we don't have time to talk about, but basically what happened was there was a jar that had uh, basically volcanic gases in it and then what was added 
excuse me, was lightning. So basically electrodes were added and we added sparks. There was water on the bottom. We could sit there and precipitate out and check out the water to see, hey, what did we make? And it turns out, as the, the result of the experiment, was we made all the precursors to life. So we found carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, well, not proteins, but amino acids. We found nucleotides in there. And all that was, you know, detected in the 1950s. Um, 50 years after the fact, the samples were kept and they were re-examined and there were even more compounds in there than were initially detected. So it was an amazing success, especially given the fact that the composition of the volcanic gases was wrong. So it's been replicated where it's using the correct composition of gases and it works even better. So... It's not like it's a grand mystery. It's just a matter of where and then what happened afterwards. So when we start looking at, you know, life starting, well, how many things were there initially? How many different species? And the answer is absolutely no clue. There's no way for us to be able to look backwards and figure that out. But what we can do is use sequences to point towards something in the middle. And the thing here in the middle is called the GCA, which is the Great Common Ancestor. There might be more than one. We have no clue. But we know that everything kind of points to something in the middle because all of us share some combination of genes that seems to always be the same. The fact that we all use the same or effectively the same genetic code, the fact that tRNAs are tRNAs and ribosomes are practically the same. You know, we have bits and pieces in common. And when we look from that point on, we see three distinct groups that emerge. The largest of them, which is this blue one, would be the bacteria. We have a little green subset referred to as the archaea, and then we have that little pink section over there, and those are the eukarya. All of this, by the way, you can examine yourself. It's called the ITOL, so the Interactive Tree of Life. It's a very fun website. So when we look at the archaeans and the bacteria, they are, are prokaryotes. So just to remind us of some stuff about prokaryotes. So they don't have strictly specialized internalized membrane-bound organelles. They primarily have one chromosome. They use binary fission. Some of this has been shown not to be true, so there are cases of specialized internal membranes, um, although the other two are still effectively true. And we put all of life, or all the prokaryotes, into either the bacteria or the archaeans. When we look at them, especially the bacteria, they have a variety of shapes and clustering forms. So in terms of shapes, they can be what called spirillum, a caucus, or a bacillus. So spiral, a sphere, or a rod. They can show up in singles or as doubles, like what we call a diplococcus. They can show up as staffs, which are clusters, or streps, which are chains. They can also form mats, and then if you add some membranes to it, biofilms. So, like, you get biofilms on your teeth when you're starting to get a cavity. The oldest evidence of bacteria, so us pushing that 3.6 billion year marker are things that we call the stromatolites. These are present day stromatolites. So these are bacteria that are capable of photosynthesis. And when we look at them, there's a whole, there's a massive set of diversity amongst the bacteria. And we know this through sequencing something called the 16S rRNA, which is a component of the ribosome. We do have a bunch of weird relationships with bacteria, so it's usually love-hate. Most of us are terrified of bacteria, and we like to, you know, have soap and antibacterial whatevers, and we want antibiotics. And not all bacteria turn out to be bad. Actually, most bacteria just exist, and, you know, if we just happen to be in the way, they don't do anything to us, and we don't do anything to them. So there's actually a lot of mutualism amongst bacteria, so we need them on our skin. They help keep us actually from getting sick from other bacteria, uh, in our intestines, they can help us break down some food. They can give us vitamins. They could actually protect us from other invading bacteria. But we also know about them with their pathogenic and parasitic, or parasitic 
um, existences, so things like E. coli and Staph aureus turn out to be um, you know, extracellular pathogens, and there are various intracellular versions like Salmonella infections. We also need them as decomposers, and we also use them to help us get rid of stuff that we don't want to keep around. So bioremediation, we also can transplant bacteria to try and you know, rejuvenate environments. These all turn out to be foods that are made by bacteria because of fermentation. The archaeans are what we refer to as extremophiles, meaning they happen to like situations that aren't as normal. So there's really high or low pH, or very high temperatures, or very low temperatures, or high salinity. Genetically, they're more eukaryotic than they are prokaryotic, which is kind of fun. In class, I showed this as a video that I took in 2001 of Volcano National Park. In particular, this is a section referred to as the Bum Pass Hell because of what it looked like. Um, so Volcano National Park is it's volcanic, and now that I'm looking at my picture of California, I totally have missed a good chunk of it, but I'm not going to redraw it. So... Volcano National Park is way up in Northern California. And you see all this coloration that you see here? All of that coloration is due to minerals and due to archaeans. It turns out there's a whole bunch of pots of like boiling water in this area. And all of them have life in them. And all that life turned out to be archaeans. When we look at the origin of a group of eukaryotes called the protists. We think that it came about due to a phenomenon called endosymbiosis, which in super simplistic terms, the endosymbiotic theory would be we had some type of original prokaryote that decided it was going to eat a bacterium, but for whatever reason, it didn't. What well, ate it, but it didn't digest it. So it was not digested. And that combo of having this bacterium that wasn't digested gave an advantage to this bacteria, to this you know primitive eukaryote, and the result would be over time the eukaryotes that happen to have mitochondria. Additionally, we could have different mitochondria-containing eukaryotes that engulfed back or engulfed some type of photosynthetic bacterium, and that became the precursor to plants for us, or some versions of protists. It turns out we can find organisms that are eukaryotes that don't have um, mitochondria. So it is one of those like, oh, so clearly there are remnants from the past where they aren't there. And we also can find some weird patterns with some chloroplasts words are hard, where they turn out to have multiple membranes, like four membranes, and that's why do they have that? And it's due to repeated endosymbiosis. For the sake of saying it, this pattern here explains why mitochondria and chloroplasts have two membranes. So we have a mitochondrion right here, so it'd have one membrane, but if it gets engulfed by the cell, that engulfing would give it a second membrane. And it turns out we even know what bacteria and chloroplasts they might, or the mitochondria and chloroplasts, what they might actually be. Mitochondria are most likely alpha proteobacteria because there are bacteria that look and behave just like mitochondria. And the chloroplasts are those blue-green algae that we've met earlier. The term protist itself is a junk term because it's basically saying, hey, you're not a prokaryote, you're not an animal, you're not a plant, you're not a fungus. So we're going to call you a protist. And in biology speak, this is referred to as being a polyphyletic clade, meaning we're clumping all sorts of different organisms. So the excavata and the chromaviolata and the rosaria and the archiplastida and the amoebozoa and the opithioconta. Like, we have all these that are really weird together, and we're just kind of clumping them all up. And saying, see, these are all protists, even though they don't necessarily have anything to do with each other. 
when we think of protists, typically we think of them as parasites, because those are the famous ones that we come across. There are others that aren't parasitic that you also come across, but these are usually what we think of. So the, the one that I usually think of immediately is plasmodium, which is um, the causative agent of malaria. One of the reasons why it's so difficult to get rid of it is because it's a eukaryotic cell. So you have to figure out a way to target a, a eukaryotic cell that's not yours. There's others like trypanosome, which causes things like Chagas disease and um, African sleeping sickness. There are also mildews that cause phenomena called blight, which is like the potato famine. We have amoebic dysentery, which is explosive diarrhea. And we have giardiasis, which is caused by a giardia species, which I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. But there are some beneficial ones, too. I mean, protists can, you know, take out, you know, dead tissue. Dinoflagellates are really pretty, so they help coral exist. And, you know, they're the cause of, you know, the sparkling ocean, if you've ever seen that. Algae turn out to be protists. If you've ever used or seen diatomaceous earth, it's used for uh, baby powder. And also, auger and agarose. Hey, you used agarose in lab. This is giardia. So the, the eye thing is actually because it has two nuclei. It's not because they actually have eyeballs. The fungi are the weirdos because now we have to start having some definitions. So when we define fungi, what we say is they're made out of this stuff called mycelia, which are these long chains of fungal cells. Some of them are like totally separate, like I have it drawn, and others actually have like a thin little connecting line between them all. So it's called non-septate and whatever. Um, they turn out to have polysaccharide cell walls, and they use chitin. They have very strange life cycles. They tend to be very complex. So if you thought like the life cycle for plasmodium, so the causative agent of malaria looks weird, like it gets worse with fungi. They primarily exist as haploids, and they only become diploid when it's time to reproduce. They use spores, and we don't call them like sperm and egg. We call them plus and minus gametes, or plus or minus haplo or, uh, types, mating types. This here is an example of that. This is for what we call the ascomycota, so these are the sac fungi, and an example of this, actually, you probably know if you've been watching TV and The Last of Us, cordyceps fungi turn out to be ascomycota, and they would use a version of this reproductive cycle. The big deal to notice is how they form these spores. These spores primarily are used in asexual reproduction, but every once in a while, we'll pair up some mating types, we will actually get fertilization, meiosis occurs, and then we're right back to where we were as being haplotype. Or haploid. Excuse me, not haplotype. Haploid. In terms of how they function, they are heterotrophs, so they have to consume to eat. They are not photosynthetic. We do think of some of them as being parasitic, especially with plants, they are parasitic. They can infect all multicellular organisms. Um... If you've ever had athlete's foot, that's a fungal infection of your skin. There's actually a condition that some people are worrying about called valley fever or coccidiomycosis. And this is due to breathing air, and it's a type of pneumonia from a fungus, which is not normal. Fungi normally do not cause pneumonia. They do not cause things like meningitis. But when they do, and you're susceptible to it, it's bad. But we also know that they can be mutualists. So a famous example of these would be the lichens. So if you've ever gone hiking and seen lichens or that little crusty stuff on trees and rocks, that's actually an, al an algae and a fungus together. When we look at the fungi, they actually have just undergone a huge taxonomic revision. And this actually isn't even up to date and correct. But the critiomycota would be the water molds. So I showed you that wasting disease of frogs last session. That's actually from one of these. The zygomycota no longer exists. They've actually been broken up into other groups. So the, the mucoromycota and the zoopagomycota, they're so new I don't know anything about them. Ascomycota are the sac fungi like cordyceps. Basidiomycota are the 
club fungi. These are the ones you probably have seen. Things like you know the mushrooms, that you, button mushrooms that you would be eating. And then another group are called the glomerulomycota or glomerular fungi, and these actually help out with plant roots. They actually form little nodules and they help plants do their thing. So next time, we're going to start talking about viruses and a little bit about the immune system.